like, okay, I think we'll make a start. Um, so thank you all for, for coming, and I'm glad that you managed to find your way to our new room um, for the departmental seminars for the rest of the term because of exams, basically. So we'll be here from um, now on. And it's my uh, pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Lauren Gorn, who doesn't really need an introduction because she's one of our homegrown uh, speakers, if you want. Um, Lauren's been at SAR since 2015 with the LDP postdoc. Um, Bridget Anne is sadly leaving us to go uh, back to Australia, to La Trobe, but um, we're happy that she's been here for a few more months, sort of doing um, both things at the same time. Um, and I'm really happy to be here because it's not, you know, sadly it's not as often as you would like necessarily that you get a chance to hear from your colleagues um, exciting research, and this is things that I sort of feel that I've heard little bits of, um, so I'm really happy to, to hear about the findings. Um, so yeah, over to, over to you. Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, Hannah and I have kind of semi-regular writing meetings, and so she's heard about this at the more painful stages of the process um, in the data coding and, and kind of preliminary writing phase. So today I'm going to present something a little bit more cohesive than maybe what she's been used to hearing. Uh, today I'm going to share with you kind of the thing that I've been working on the most continuously while here as an ELDP postdoc, which is beginning to look at the gestural repertoire of Shuba speakers in narratives. Um, if for some reason you would like the slides, I don't have a printed handout, but there's a link there. The link will be at the end of the slides as well, or just get in touch with me and I'll send them to you. Um, so I'm going to talk about two different gestures today after a kind of brief introduction to kind of why we might care about looking at gesture in this community and in this context. I'm going to look at one that's called the rotated palms interrogative and one that is a way gesture that's used with negation. And these two have been my focus largely because of this single example that I have here. I'm going to play the video for you um, and I'm not, I'm not going to talk you through it at first. I'll just play it a couple of times and have a look at the movement of Pasang Maya's hands while she's telling this story. So this is a story um, that is in a really nicely illustrated picture book that a student in Singapore put together for me while I was a postdoc at NTU. Um, it comes from this telling of the story and it's about this old woman who lives alone um, and she's... She's quite miserly and she gets very upset when the crows come to eat her food and she complains. And then uh, there's a very nice kind of, I guess, schadenfreude moment at the end where uh, the crows eat her food, uh, she has no food and she dies. And then in the afterlife, um, because she told the crows to kind of get stuffed, they, they manage to reciprocate uh, in, in the next life. It's a, it's a fairly... Uh, a prosaic story of, I guess, being a little bit nicer. Um, but here she's complaining she has no food. Um, and as, as Pasang Mai as Mai is talking as the woman, um, you'll see she makes some gestures. Oh, except that this is going to be fun because I don't have audio. Just a moment. Uh, There's a very calculated uh, Thing to make you look at the gestures before you hear it with the speech, um, because I know you're all fluent Shuba speakers. Let's try this again. I'll let that person come in. I'm not entirely convinced we're going to have sound. It's one thing I should have tested. There we go. We'll go back to the start. <laughs> So, this is possibly not the most uh, exciting examples of gestures you may be expecting, but we have uh, some very small movements of the hands there. Um, but these rotations seem to be moving in two different directions and they seem to have two different functions. So we have a rotation upwards. She's asking, what should I do? I, she, she says, I have nothing to eat. She moves her hands back down. And so there's a kind of a question and that involves an upward movement and there's discussion of having nothing and that involves some kind of downward movement. And it was watching her tell this story and then watching her 
tell it many, many more times during the transcription process. I was interested in what was happening um, with those gestures and also in, in other narratives where I saw other speakers making similar hand movements. And so pulling apart what is happening with those very subtle hand movements there, they're very easy to miss or not pay much attention to, what they can tell us about um, the way speakers structure their language, what they can tell us about the relationship between gesture and speech. Uh, this is one of a couple of slides I have in this talk, which I like to think of as my like performed authenticity slides. Um, here's some nice some field work, but it kind of gives you an idea of the the context in which we film these stories. So, what has happened in the Shuba documentation process, and that's been a, it's been a really nice process for me because it's been driven as much by the interests of what the community want to have recorded um, and what they're interested in documenting as their language, as it has been by my linguistic interests. And so um, what usually happens is that I will turn up with a camera and then we'll have a chat and we'll go visit some people. So here we have um, Karma and we'll see some of his recordings later on. Um, that is actually Pasang Maya over there and our language documentation kitten, which came along for this session here. Um, so we kind of go along and there's a, there's a bit of a process of discussion. It's a, it's a live cat, it's not, it's not a dead cat, uh, which is a, a useful tool in recording. Um, this is a live cat, not so useful, but very cute. Um, and so what happens is we kind of go with the camera, we kind of have a bit of a negotiation about what is to be recorded, and then people share with us kind of stories or oral histories. So a lot of what you'll see today in the recordings is people either sharing folk tales um, or kind of personal history or, or history of life in this community. Um, and that's been really nice for me. In fact, I have completely stepped aside from the filming. One of the younger guys took a real interest in it. Um, and so I don't even perform this level of performed authenticity often in the documentation. Um, this is the kind of background on what gesture has been studied in this area. You don't need to read any of the text because the answer is basically nothing. So Shuba is a Tibeto-Burman language, one of about 480 languages in the Tibeto-Burman family. We have almost no research into the relationship between speech and gesture in the family at all. I found an unpublished master's dissertation, so I have something to put on the slide, that's great. Um, and in terms of research into gesture in Nepal, um, we have very little. Again, I found a kind of one subset of one study that was in Nepal and Laos and Thailand. Um, so this has been a, the kind of complete lack of literature both within the area and within the language family has been part of my primary motivation for wanting to create a better account of what people are doing with their gestures during narrative um, in Shuba as part of the documentation process. Um, I think that's really important. A lot of the time people who work on gesture kind of trot out these, when people talk, they do this with their hands and it means this. Um, and that is really grounded in a very limited set of studies. So this is a slightly facetious map that I've put together of languages in which we have at least one published study on the gestural repertoire of the speakers. And what we see is there is a slight gap in the literature, um, also known as South Asia, um, and so this study is, is trying to fill one tiny part of that gap. Um, I have to say though, even compared to when I started looking at the gesture literature kind of five or ten years ago, there are a lot more points on this map than there were. Um, it was very, very much, and it still is today, focused on that continent. Um, to give you a bit more background onto the language, in the, into the language itself, um, my research has been on a cluster of languages um, that are kind of the Yolmo languages. I did my PhD with Lamjung Yolmo speakers. Um, they're called Kagate on the map here, but the Shuba speakers I've been working with on and off for the last kind of six or seven years to document their language. In the last three years, we've had an opportunity to really build that documentation. Um, although they have a different uh, language name and cultural group name, and that name is currently in flux as well. Um, they are linguistically related to this larger chain of languages. So um, at some point, two to four hundred years ago, um, people moved across 
the Himalaya and settled in the Malumchi and Halambu valleys. And that is where the kind of traditional Yolmu communities are. And then one to two centuries ago, we had groups migrate to Lamjung, to uh, the Shuba speaking area, and down to Ilam. Um, and all about the same size, one to one and a half thousand um, speakers in these isolated groups. And they've remained isolated um, up until recently. I was very uh, excited and lucky to go to Ilam as part of the documentation of Shuba. Um, I took a couple of Shuba guys with me there, and that's, that's quite a very different landscape. It's full of tea plantations, whereas um, Shuba speakers and other Yolmo speakers live in much more rugged, uh, mountainous rather than hilly terrain. Um, so they all live in, in hills or mountains to some extent. They have been isolated. They're increasingly making intergroup links, um, but the projects have begun to kind of document all of those. <coughs> the corpus of materials that I am using for today's analysis um, is, is kind of a subset of the larger set of materials that we've built for the ELDP project and for my postdoc at NTU in Singapore before this. Um, so we now have in the corpus, actually this is a bit out of date, we probably have about 15 hours um, of recordings in Shuba um, across a range of narratives. For this today, I have worked with four hours of transcribed materials um, with 10 participants. They're archived, I've given the link for Paradisec there, they're also about to be live on ELA as well. Um, you can access those. Every recording I talk about today has a reference code, so you can find the recording at the archive if you want to listen to it again or see the example or see the example in its larger context. Um, because it is a somewhat opportunistic corpus, we're sometimes limited by, for example, a lack of very good light in this middle panel here. Um, but this was the only day these gentlemen were in town, so we kind of had to make the most of it. Um, you can kind of make him out, but it's a bit hard there. Um, otherwise, with Pasang Maya and a lot of the others, we're sitting outside, so the light is great. It occasionally gets a bit windy. Um, and part of it is always, people always like to kind of look at the videos afterwards, and I think that's an important part of the process, is making sure people feel comfortable um, with the recordings we've made so that they feel comfortable with the idea that I will show them to other people. Um, from that four hours, there are about 20 tokens of the rotated palms gesture, and there are 13 tokens of this away negative gesture, both of which I will look at in this talk. Um, and the full set of tokens for each is given in slides at the end of this talk. Um, they're very unexciting, detail-oriented slides. Um, it will give the speaker the time in the recording, the speech, and a translation. So this is some work that I presented at the International Gesture Society conference back last summer, um, and I'm now uh, in the process of writing up on the repeated palms interrogative gesture. So this is that upward movement um, that we saw in Pasang Maya's recording. And if you have ever worked or lived or traveled through the larger kind of Indian influenced area, this gesture may not be entirely unfamiliar to you. Um, in its use without speech, it can be more emblematic. So it can, this is a gesture that can be used without speech. And if I do this to someone, it would mean something like, what are you doing? Um, if I did something like that with a bit of a head flick, it usually means where you're going. So um, it has a pretty stable meaning in the absence of speech. And I have this kind of, um, just some illustrations of its broader use. So on the left here we have two of the Ilam Yolmu speakers and one of them used this gesture during uh, one of his narratives. This is a photo I took um, of a woman through a window in a public square in Kathmandu. Um, a very lovely example of kind of valley uh, architectural carving there, uh, but also a really nice example of gesture. So something for everyone in that photograph. Um, and the photo on the right is a, a woman in, this was a, a photo that was attached to a lot of Facebook posts and public media post the, 19, uh, the 2015 earthquakes in Nepal. 
and the rotated hands along with the shrug indicates a meaning of like, well, in Nepali, it's kergane, and it's kind of a, a meaning of like, what are you going to do? Um, it has a kind of fatalistic, it's quite, quite useful if you've ever had to navigate um, Kathmandu traffic um, or if you've ever had to sit at kind of immigration lines in Kathmandu, this is a very useful one. What are you, you going to do? There's, it's, it's beyond your control. Um, so the kind of, you know, this, this woman with her fatalistic shrug of what are you going to do and the crumbled building in the background kind of encapsulates a lot of the sentiment as people were trying to put their lives together after the earthquake. Um, and it, it, the orientation of the hands I'll talk about, but it can be kind of open like this or up like this. Um, so this gesture occurs kind of around questions. And so just to kind of give you a, a brief introduction to questions in the language, there's no change in word order, but you'll often get a bit of rising intonation. Um, there are a variety of question types and they'll be relevant when we're talking about kind of the, the functions of this. Um, and they're the question types you get in, in all languages. Polar questions where there's uh, a kind of one or two options. Alternative when you're given multiple constrained options other than just yes and no. And then content questions which are kind of more open in terms of how you can respond. And uh, I, I've done a bit of work with the question structure in Lam Jung Yolmu, which is closely related uh, in terms of the evidential structure. So there's a set of evidentials that mark source of knowledge and these are about anticipating. So if I ask you a question, I will try and use the evidential that I think you are most likely to respond with, which is not the same for evidential languages across the world. There are a variety of strategies languages use. Um, and so this is kind of what we know syntactically, but we need to build a bigger picture of the pragmatics of interrogativity and how that works um, in these languages. I think sometimes you know, we, we get as far as being able to kind of pick out the basic syntactic functions, but it's good to have a, a bigger picture idea of this. So the thing with the can make gestures kind of fun or challenging or very frustrating to work with sometimes is that they have compared to what you might be used to with syntactic features, a great deal of underspecification in terms of how they're performed. So what you're going to see in the discussion of the features, and today I'll be looking at the hand shape, the orientation, which hand people use, and the trajectory or movement of the hands. Um, not all gestures conform on all dimensions to the kind of summary that I'm giving, but what I hope that I can kind of convey to you is that all of these gestures are kind of of a broad type. So as I mentioned, the hand shape um, tends to have, um, as I kind of was doing, but it can have a kind of a, a seven hand or a pistol hand um, kind of shape, or it can be a bit looser, but there's usually some kind of, um, you know, if you, if you wanted to really over articulate this, as an emblem in the absence of speech, you might do a kind of full clenching in of these fingers and extension of your thumb and index finger. Um, but often what we find is in speech, it's a very under-specified. So that introductory example from Pasang Maya, it's hardly more than just a little flick and the hands aren't particularly loosely or tightly bunched. The hand orientation, as I mentioned, can vary um, either it can be horizontal or it can be vertical. Um, my, again, kind of only looking at this corpus, but also um, bringing in kind of anecdotal examples that I can think of. In the face-to-face, -face, uh, while talking, using these with speech, the orientation tends to be this kind of horizontal, um, but in the absence of speech, when trying to use them emblematically, you get a more vertical example and this is a really nice just illustration of that. This photo on the end here is of a young Shuba speaking man at his wedding um, and in this really noisy environment he's kind of trying to signal someone far away and he's kind of sending them this kind of question. The question is possibly what's happening or what are you doing um, but in the absence of speech it has a more vertical orientation. 
And um, I have a, to kind of show that these things aren't always fixed and they can be kind of played with in interaction, I have a really nice example from Kathmandu and a speaker of Newar who I lived with um, and, and Nepali. So this is not a Shuba speaker, but as we were approaching each other on the busy street, um, and I kind of, we, we didn't expect to see each other um, walking down a street near the house. And as we're approaching each other, I get this from her. And so instead of being a kind of publicly displayed use of the gesture, it's just, it was just a little flick around. And so this is kind of a, a personal use of the gesture, even in a public space. So orientation, although I say, you know, it's either vertical or horizontal, um, these things can be played with in context. Um, the handedness of this gesture, so whether people perform it one-handed or two, um, varies depending on speaker, which given that everyone who's in this corpus was only recorded on one day, it may be that there's inter-speaker variation, it may be depending on the context, the speaker is more likely to use one hand or two. Um, Larkel on the right here is a fabulous over-articulator of gestures. Um, both for this and for the other gesture that I'll look at, in both cases, whatever the most extreme hand shape or trajectory is going to be, you can put money on in the fact that it's going to be Larkel who's going to be my example for that. Um, whereas Jit here has, he spent the entire recording fiddling with bits of grass from the, so he always had his other hand full. So it's not clear if it's a preference for one-handed or he was just kind of distracted by fidgeting. Um, but there is, there's a mixed preference and there seems to be a mixed preference in terms of, you know, we saw the young guy in the still photo was using one hand, the old woman with her kind of shrug in the earthquake was using two. So the handedness doesn't appear to be particularly fixed. Um, in terms of the trajectory, speakers move their hands upwards um, or they just rotate them from wherever they're resting at that point. Um, it seems like the upward movement is a, a thing that can happen, but it's the rotation of the hand that's primary here. And uh, in interestingly, or kind of a, a thing to discuss more broadly, is that we know cross-linguistically that gestures that are palm upward tend to get, convey some sense of presentation to people. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm presenting you with an idea or the topic of conversation or something very concrete and physical, like miming a tray or something. But um, palm upward gestures tend to have a sense of showing stuff. Um, the rotation and interrogativity appear to be somewhat interrelated. Um, so when I presented this at ISGS, Adam Kendon, who spent many years working with Australian Aboriginal Sign Languages, um, was like, oh, are we th exactly the same function with exactly the same kind of gesture occurs in these languages. And obviously the fact that it is exactly the same is to some degree kind of the kind of coincidence where the word for dog is the same in English and Babaram. Sometimes there's a bit of just a confluence of um, chance, but to the same extent, I think that there is something about the way, and we'll see this more strongly with the negative away gesture that I'll come to in a minute, is that there is something about the turning of the hand that indicates a kind of metaphorical, so to speak, kind of turning over of the, the responsibility in the interaction. So I'm kind of, if I'm asking a question, I'm kind of moving the burden of the interaction over to the other speaker and the opening of the hands upward, but the rotation seems to be part of that. In terms of the function of this gesture, um, as an interrogative, it tends to have three broad functions. And I will go through these. Um, these functions are all a, a pragmatic function. So when a lot of people think about gestures, the first things they think about are diactics, which point to stuff, um, or iconic gestures that refer to objects in the real world. Um, so I might refer to um, my cup of coffee that I had earlier, um, or to the computer, and these kind of represent physical things. Um, another function that gestures can have, and that this gesture is having, is marking 
something about the pragmatic structure of the interaction. Um, and here we move from pragmatic functions that are very much grounded in the overtly grammatical nature of interrogativity and move through to something a bit more abstract than that. So I'll go through those. The first is that it occurs with interrogative utterances. Um, in the examples that I have, it tends to give it a bit of an uh, a rhetorical sense. Um, that might just be because I have a lot of narratives where people are saying quite rhetorical, kind of silly questions. Um, again, we have Pasang Maya and the story of the, the crows. And she's like, well, what do I have to eat? So this is the example that we saw earlier. So she's saying, Chi Sandi, what do I? So when she says, what do I eat? She turns her hands this way. It's a bit facetious. She's like, well, what am I going to eat? I've got, she doesn't have anything. That is abundantly clear from the story. Um, but the, uh, because of this kind of a, a, a question that she really wants to impress upon her interlocutor, you know, I don't have anything crows, what am I going to eat? Um, that's kind of what the gesture helps to mark. Um, we see it here again. So during the, during the, he's, he's kind of talking, he's like, well, what do I say? And he's kind of, he's kind of asking me and the other people who are sitting there while we're recording. He's kind of asking himself. He doesn't really want an answer. It's, it's a rhetorical question, but it does have a grammatical question structure. And this is another story. Pasang I had a great collection of stories. Um, this is one about the jackal who tricks someone um, into admitting that they've done something foolish by doing something foolish and prevent and asking them to um, challenging them to kind of admit that the jackal has done something foolish and by extension themselves. <coughs> um, and so the jackal puts on, uh, he, he rubs his face with coal and he, he walks past this guy and the guy's like, what, what have you been doing? Your face is covered in coal, what's happening? And the jackal's like, oh, I have been so busy lighting fires in the river. And the guy goes, well, you've been lighting fires in the river? Like, how do you do that? And then the jackal says, well, you can't light a fire in the river, can you? Um, and you also can't say that your oil extraction machine gave birth to that guy's horse, so give that guy's horse back. Um, and so this, this very rhetorical question is accompanied by this rotating gesture. Uh, and she holds it all the way through. She holds it through the, you also can't light a fire in the river, can you? So she holds it even for the tag to really enforce the kind of fact that this is a, a larger rhetorical question. We also see that these gestures are used with non-interrogative utterances. And in these cases, um, you might say, well, it's, it's used without a question, so it's not really doing anything questiony. Um, but in these utterances, they tend to have either a sense in which the person is posing a hypothetical um, or the speaker is uncertain about the content of the utterance. Um, so this is a, uh, talking about the difference between cats and dogs. Um, so that was very quick there. I have just a, a, a cap to show you that there was a very quick rotation of the hand there. Um, but what we see here is he's, he's posing a hypothetical. Um, cats get fed because they beg. There's a big difference between cats and dogs. Um, dogs don't beg. If they begged, it, it could eat. So we have um, this kind of quick rotation of the hand there as part of the hypothetical structure. And uh, in this one, we see Sangbu is talking about as though the events were a dream. So there's some kind of uncertainty or unreality to the events. And so he's kind of 
not, not staking particular certainty on it in the same way that some people might use an interrogative to mark reduced certainty. He's using this hand shape here as part of that. We also see here a nice example of a kind of middle ground between this full-blown emblematic use um, and use that's independent of speech but very closely related to the following content. Um, and so conveniently, this is a question we get quite a few times throughout the recordings where people kind of talk and then they, they're like, oh, uh, what, what should I say? Um, and it turns out that these are great as a, a location for this kind of, of gesture. It's great for these kind of rhetorical questions. So what we see here is karma um, is, uh, he performs the gesture and then there's actually quite a bit of um, time between the gesture and the utterance. So he says, he kind of stops and he's like, what do I say? And it kind of gives you an example of how this gesture can move away from being something that's closely tied to speech into something that is a full-blown emblem by itself without any speech and it still conveys this kind of question sense. Um, this corpus obviously doesn't lend itself to the use of this gesture in the absence of speech because it is a corpus designed around people speaking. Um, but what we see with this gesture is that it is, um, although we have this kind of unified hand shape across the different uses, um, it, it can occur in a range of pragmatic functions, including with questions, in question-like scenarios, and in the absence of speech. Um, and so what we have now is a much broader idea of interrogativity um, in Shuba and how it is used interactively beyond just the syntax, but also in terms of, of how people engage with that in interaction and how they mark things as being kind of rhetorically interrogative um, and that things like hypothetical dates might actually be closer to things like interrogativity than a purely grammatical analysis might give you. The, so we've kind of covered the bit where Puzzle Meyer in the video puts her hands up, so we're like one second in, and now we're going to look at the part where pretty soon before or after she, she flicks her hands down and away. Um, and so we will have covered kind of two seconds of the video um, in trying to understand what's happening with the gestures in it. Um, so an earlier version of this work was presented at the Egesto conference in Portugal earlier this year, um, and I'm writing it up this week. Um, so Hannah will get to hear all about the writing process in our next session. Um, but for now, you kind of you get the, the videos and the fun bits. So as I mentioned before, raising the hands up across the world's languages and the gestural repertoires that they have seems to indicate some kind of um, often presenting something um, either concrete or abstract to, to your interlocutor. There is also a strong set of literature that some use of awareness in the gesture and the awareness might be kind of holding something with your hand shape away or it might be the trajectory of movement indicates some kind of negative thing. Um, so unsurprisingly, again, the majority of this literature comes from European languages. Um, Kendon described this um, for Italian and English. And we often find in the literature there's a lot of agreement. People say, you know, so for Kendon, Italian and English both have this sense that a holding away gesture indicates something that's denied, negated, interrupted or stopped. Um, we've also seen other people work on English, work on French and Spanish, and Bressem and Mueller have put together a kind of survey paper that draws together a lot of that research um, and attempts to define some kind of larger action scheme for the relationship between away and negation. Um, Bresim has also extended that to Savo Savo, which is a Papuan language of the Solomon Islands. So that is a very excitingly not European data point for that. And Brooks in her survey of the repertoire of um, 
Gauteng young men who are so like young black men in urban Johannesburg um, in that repertoire set there are quite a few gestures that have some kind of relationship between away and negation and the, the kind of the theory is that um, the action scheme demonstrates some kind of embodied root of negation so if we move something out of our immediate space, then we're kind of absenting it from the discourse space or negating it from the kind of conversational space. The Schubert corpus is actually a really useful place to look for the relationship between negation and awareness, um, partly because of the genre in which a lot of people speak and something that is kind of, can be translated as kind of suffering stories. So whereas we might be taught to always put on our bravest face and not bore people with sad news and always try and be upbeat, in uh, Schubert narrative what we see frequently is that it is not only perfectly acceptable to talk about your sufferings but it's a way of kind of marking your legitimacy. Um, and to be honest, I'm not really like a narrative studies person so I don't want to kind of, um, kind of over, overstate this but um, Here's a nice uh, excerpt from a song that was illustrated as part of the picture book series. And this kind of conversational uh, tone is pretty common uh, in the area, and not just within, I would say, the Shuba community, but kind of across this area more generally. So, you know, we don't have buses, we don't have electricity. Um, you know, we, we do it pretty tough, but we kind of, it's, it's a kind of, a, you know, as an Australian English speaker, the battler mentality um, kind of comes to mind pretty quickly. Like people doing it tough and proud of themselves for doing it tough. Um, but it leads to lots of situations where people talk about what they don't have, which is really useful for this kind of gesture analysis. Um, so I'm going to look at one particular away gesture, which involves a something of a sweeping away of the hands. Um, I don't want to say that this is the only negation gesture that we get in the language. It's part of a larger repertoire. I'm just going to be focusing on this one today just to kind of prove there are other negative gestures in the language. We conveniently have someone doing a kind of wiping away and a, a head shake at the same time for saying you can't do something. doesn't want to play. Too much negation. It's not going to do it. It's not the kind of... So he's got the head shake and he's got this kind of wiping gesture. They are two things we are not looking at. Um, but I wanted to just kind of let you know that I, I'm not saying this is the entirety of negation, um, but it is one function of it. So as a kind of overview holistically of this type of away gesture and what it's doing. The hands are loose. Um, they tend to, um, the, the fingers tend to splay outward and open up towards the end of the stroke of that gesture. Palms are down. There's a, a kind of a movement away. It's often an opening of the hand and just an extension of the finger. Larkel, my great over gesture performer, will give you the kind of full forearm movement, but for other speakers, it's generally just the hand. Um, mostly two-handed, I only have one example of a one-handed performance, so unlike the interrogative where it kind of people would do two or one, for this both hands seem to be important. Um, and it's aligned with a negative noun phrase, which is often a negative indefinite pronoun. So something like we have nothing or there's no one. Um, and it has a function of pragmatically emphasising the, the lack of something in the speech. And it's closest to, as I said, Bressam and Mueller did this survey. Um, it's closest to their sweeping away type. So they subcategorized the away negative gestures that they had. I'll come back to closest to as a phrase um, towards the end of this analysis. So this is kind of my, for me personally, kind of the prototypical performance of this gesture. We have two here, one where he says we have no roads and one where he says we have no light or electricity. 
It's kind of uh, sweeping away. The hand shape has a trajectory, as I said, of, of down and away. And there's a bit of a small rotation there, which kind of gives it that sweeping away feeling that Bresson and Mueller talk about. So just now that you've been introduced to the interrogative gesture, and now that you have been introduced to kind of the basic idea of this negative away gesture, we can revisit um, Pasang Maya's uh, narrative that I played at the start, and you can kind of look at that hand movements again with that in mind. So these are pretty underperformed in terms of if you weren't looking for them, it would just look like she's kind of moving her hands around a little bit, um, but they occur in the kind of prototypical area. Even though the fingers aren't very articulated, we get those movements of the hands. Um, yay, locale, always there with a kind of extreme example. So now you've seen these tiny little flicks of the hands. Um, in similar situations, we get this from good old Larkel. So we get extension and then even more extension there, which is really great. And this tends to be, this is not quite the same brushing away, but it's definitely a moving away trajectory there. Um, the palm downward orientation is still more or less maintained. Um, and we do see some degree of openness from everyone else, but definitely not this fully extended. Um, I alternate between wondering if this is like a slightly different gesture um, or if he is, and I think this is possibly more the case, just a very exuberant performer when it comes to telling a good story. Um, this is my only example of one-handed use. And I, I don't know if you'll see from this clip or not, but I think it comes directly after another one-handed gesture. So the fact that it's one-handed might just be constrained by the previous um, previous gesture use. Right. So I've, I've clipped that he's so he's got one hand down and he's already used his hand for something else, and then because it's just sitting there, he goes straight into a one-handed performance of the gesture. And you really see with Sangbu this opening out and flicking away hand shape. Um, one thing that is really neat about the negative away gesture is how neatly it aligns with the speech. Um, and I say that, but this is actually true for a lot of gesture. Um, the integration with speech is incredibly well-timed. And whenever, whenever I teach gesture courses, I feel like at least 50% of the course is me just saying really stupidly obvious things. But even to this day, it completely blows my mind how the human brain works. So these people are hitting the stroke. So they're hitting the bit where they kind of flick the fingers outward at the start of the negative. And the negatives in this language all start with a me or a ma. So um, as they're saying me or ma, their hands are doing this. Now, in order to get your hands to be doing that at the point that you are saying me or ma, you had to have started moving them at some earlier point. So you have to know. And like, this is. Like, it's pretty obvious in order to do this at this point, you have to be doing like the getting to that point earlier. But the fact that our brains can know that they're going to have to be hitting this in the speech and this in the gesture, but they have to know that at an earlier time point constantly amazes me. Um, and what we see consistently, there are only one or two examples that don't fit this. And I think they both have good narrative reasons why they don't. Um, but what we see again and again is that the onset begins at the start of that negative phrase. Oh, the onset begins at the start of the noun phrase, more or less, and the stroke hits the stroke with the negative content. Um, not only is it cool that all the speakers do this across the corpus, but this actually conforms to what Harrison has found for English. So Harrison looked at the temporal alignment of the stroke and the negative in English and found pretty much the same thing. So this is something that is kind of how humans do negation. Um, something is inherent about that node of the negation. So this, in this language, it's me or ma. In English, it would be something like not or won't. Um, 
but speakers structure their negative utterance and structure their performance of a negative gesture very temporally tied around that, that one node. In terms of the function, the gesture, kind of unsurprisingly probably at this point, is used to emphasise the negative value of the noun phrase. So we don't see this away gesture. People aren't saying, oh, we have roads, we have electricity. This gesture with the outward away movement only occurs when talking about what they don't have or what the person in the story doesn't have. Um, so if they have nothing, um, if they've got no electricity, if they've got no roads, then this gesture is used. So the fact that we have some close relationship semantically and functionally between negation and away means that it fits Bresson and Mueller's away family broadly. But if we look at their 2014 paper, they specifically say that it's motivated by keeping or moving things away from the discourse space, and I think we can agree that's kind of what's happening, but they say that the space is cleared of annoying or otherwise unwanted objects in the discourse. And my feeling is that it's very hard to argue that Schuber speakers do not want electricity um, or do not want, or the, the woman in the story did not want food. Um, so I think what we need here is actually a broader approach to the relationship between awareness and negation and this idea of unwanted things doesn't quite fit um, because these objects that people very much want. So for these, what we have is a set of gestures with co-speech pragmatic functions. Um, they emphasize negative noun phrases, um, particularly indefinite pronouns. Um, as I said, there's no use these occur with positives. Um, it broadens the survey, so now we have you know, four or five European languages, and we've got, wow, we've got like three non-European languages um, that indicate that this relationship between awareness and negation fits with our idea of embodied gestures that we see um, across different languages. Um, but it also indicates that we need a broader understanding of what that relationship is. So there's are two studies that I've been working on while I've been at SOAS. Um, it's just another opportunity for some performed authenticity, but an opportunity to kind of do something I really like to do in Nepal, which is just sit and take stock of uh, all of that. You don't really need to take home any of those specific points, um, but if there was a conclusion of things that I would like you to remember in descending order of importance, <laughs> um, video your documentation. If I had just made audio recordings, I'd be sitting here going, oh, I vaguely remember she did something weird with her hands, but I can't for the life of me remember what that is. Um, remember that gesture is part of the linguistic content. Um, so when you're thinking about questions or negation, go back and look and see if there is any of this kind of consistent performance of gesture that corresponds with it. Um, you don't have to study it yourself. You could always drop me an email, which is at the end of these talk. Um, you know, there, there are people who are very interested in this stuff who I think would be very interested in seeing more data from languages that are outside of Europe um, and those other places. And then remember that gesture can be useful in giving you insights into the structure of speech. So here we saw that kind of the structure of negation is um, very consistently performed both lexically and gesturally. Um, the pragmatic function of speech, so there are non-interrogatively marked speech hacks that have uh, sentences that seem to have some kind of relationship to interrogativity um, in this talk and the embodied nature of cognition. So there is something about a lack of something or removing something from the discourse space that relates to negativity and there's something about rotating the hands that appears to be kind of turning over the interactional turn um, and that is one of the reasons that I think gesture is cool. And one of the nice things about doing this research and having the opportunity to come here and work on an ELDP fellowship is that I can now do this. Um, and that has been very satisfying. As I promised, here are the tokens that I talked about. These are the references. And I have um, the slides in the link that is conveniently cropped there. But I can send those to you if you would like. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lauren.
Um, do we have any questions, comments, other people's experiences that they want to, to share or draw on? Anecdata, always welcome. I was just wondering in general, and this is, like, this is new to me, like with that inversion for the interrogatives, does that have anything to do with inversion in the syntax as well that people use to make questions? Don't we would need a lot more need gesture, more. but yeah. I mean, people, and, and this kind of, you know, I, I don't want to even like say mm -hmm. words because I'll just come out with some offensively stereotypical accent, but the like twisting your hands and, you know, this is, this, it, when I tell people this about the work I'm doing in Nepal, people are like, well, obviously, like, <laughs> and I just, I just, <laughs> yeah, obviously that is going to be a question. Mm -hmm. um, so. The, you know, we're still figuring out the relationship between these things. Um, but, there is, but there is no inversion in questions in Shuba. Yeah, they don't have so, it. But if it's all cognitively based, then it's... Yeah, I don't... I, I have no feeling for the cognitive basis of lexical inversion in sentence structure. But if someone does, it'd be cool. Other questions? Yeah? Did you have the... So did you segment for the form, the gesture form, and then you turned the sound on and, sound, and found that? I, yeah. So there's a paper, Bressam and Mueller have a new paper coming out in Linguistic Vanguards that I was just reading, so that's going to be the springboard for my answer, in which they say looking at the relationship between speech and gesture in these kind of studies tends to either come, they go speech first, and then they go, oh, what's happening with the gesture? or they go form first for the gesture and then they say, what speech does that link with? This process has been, in as much as it can be, much more kind of both at the same time um, because I've been grappling with the basic transcription and documentation while also keeping an eye on these forms. So the process has generally been, I would say from my uninterrogated un instinct is that I've been looking at the form confirming that it has that kind of lexical relationship and it's not someone saying you know I brushed off the dusty clothes or something making sure it doesn't have that kind of lexical relationship um, and then going from there so it is very much um, analyzing an opportunistic collection of data and then in an opportunistic way analyzing that. And I'm, I'm aware of that, but that is uh, kind of the challenge of working with this kind of corpus. And then I have another question. Yeah. Uh, in that, do it include sign language too, or is it just gesture with your hands? Um, that just includes studies that have been done on um, gesture. So, so, but I mean, different sign languages have had differing degrees of gesture analysis done as well as basic sign but there is um so one really cool thing that we have for the interrogative is that in indian sign and pakistani sign this hand shape is actually the wh question marker mm -hmm. so it is a sufficiently common emblematic gesture in the area that has been grammaticalized into the local sign languages so that was a really nice um um, someone at ISGS at the end was just like, oh, you mean just like in, in Indian Sign Language? And I was like, um, yes, apparently exactly like in Indian Sign Language. So it kind of gives a good indication of the, the strength of that aerial spread of that gesture. Maybe I can ask okay. a question. So actually, maybe following on from the previous two. So um, one was kind of related to your question. So I don't work on gesture, but I do work on syntax. Mm -hmm. And it may be just by chance, but the two examples that you draw on, so interrogatives and negation, are things that are cross-linguistically like marked in one way or another, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you talk about, yeah, I think even in some of your negation examples, there's an emphatic marker before them. So I wonder if you can, if you have any thoughts or comments on the idea that if you take something like that, which seems to be what most of your speakers are doing and most of them are sitting down as unmarked, and anything else as somehow marked, um, whether you would find or expect, so like 
crossing risk that you have like negation, um, interrogatives, other type of focus constructions, relative clauses, all those kind of things. Also co-articulated, co co-gestured. Um, yes. Etc. The answer is yes. Yeah. The majority of papers on pragmatic functions of gesture look at questions or things that turn the interaction over to someone else or negation or emphasis. So the, there's a paper on the ring gesture in German um, and I, I know as an English speaker I sometimes use this as well but when you really want to make a point clear or really when you really want to make a point clear you use two um, and so um, these interactively and syntactically marked and gesturally marked constructions I think it's a it is a, a confluence that happens there. And then maybe a, a related yes. point, because you mentioned um, the grammaticalization perhaps in Pakistani and Indian sign language. So you have this point where um, Russell and Wunder's study, they have this kind of brushing things away or refusing or not yep. wanting them. Um, and you say that that's not, like they're not saying, oh, we don't want electricity, we don't want this. Yep. Um, I wonder about the idea that actually it is a grammaticalized version, so basically kind of metaphorical or semantic extension from not wanting something in a much more literal sense to negating and, and those kind of things, rather than actually we don't want more. Yeah, I mean my gut feeling is, uh, two things, there are two directions, I'll go in here. My gut feeling is that, um, and this kind of what, what I'm working on now, is that it's actually the opposite and the the kind of just general negation in a way is, is a bit, the absence of something is what's being marked and then the kind of thing that they're talking about is an additional meaning, but that would involve working on more languages than Shuba and I feel like I already have enough going on there. Um, and the other thing is that, um, there was something, I'm just gonna have a drink of water. Well, I think about the other thing I was gonna say, which is um, in their study, they talk about this brushing away gesture as being um, it. It is for things that are like trivial or not. Imp you know, in the way that you like. For them, the extension of you flick stuff off. It's it's a very deprecating. That is the word I want. Deprecating action, um, and I think to some extent that captures something. What's happening here? It's like we don't have roads, but like it's it's not a thing to be made a thing of. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's something about the way these hardships are discussed, where this deprecating sense is, is a useful way of thinking about it, but that's as far as I've got with that so far. So, yeah, I, I mean, what we need to do now, slash me need to do now, is go back to an English corpus and start building examples where we find a way being used with, um, not necessarily disparaging senses. And then, yeah, whether it's grammaticalized one way or the other is then the next thing to figure out. And perhaps different types of negation, right? So not, yeah. so. I well, this not is, so their, their analysis was that like all negation mm -hmm. and awareness is embedded in this, things are unwanted. And I, th I think that is an overgeneralization. Um, if you're just talking about one type and then one kind, like if it was just the brushing away, you could make a case that it's grammaticalized, but when it's all, saying that all negation and awareness is centered on this thing being unwanted. Um, I find that's a bit of an overstep. Sorry, I just about, um, it was just a thought, and I don't know if you know about whether you have this or not, but I was wondering, you were saying that um, it's, uh, so the negative gesture is tied to coincide with negative material, whatever that might be in the language. Yeah. I was wondering what happens in languages where you get kind of five parts like marking of negation. I have one dot two. Um, so yeah. one, one thing that's really interesting is that the difference between Harrison's analysis of English and my analysis of Shuba is Harrison gets a lot more long holds of negation gestures and that's because in English anything that's bound to the negative, anything that's subordinate to it is occurring after it and so the gesture gets held for the scope of the negation. Whereas because in Shuba the verb is final, um, even if there were, and, and the problem is really that a lot of these sentences are very short, but nothing pre the negation is included in the scope. So 
um, it only seems to cover the head and nothing that's in its scope that occurs before it. So the possibility that different negation structures in different languages engage that timing differently is really quite probable and bipartite would be super fun. So. You've also got varieties of English that have negative, negative concord and those that don't. Yeah. It'll be interesting to know if there's a difference there as well. Yeah. So there was French in one of, the one, of, one of the studies, not one of your studies. I think one of the, yeah. maybe not negation, but yeah. There was, yeah, some French away stuff. Yeah. yeah. Should go back and look and see if they've got anything overtly mm -hmm. mentioned about temporal stuff. Yeah. But yeah, gesture, timing, and like lexical structure is a massively awesome but under under examined field. So as with as with most of these talks, the answer is <laughs> yes, that would be awesome <laughs> for someone else to find out. <laughs> Yeah. I was just wanted to ask you another a, a sort of unrelated question. Mm -hmm. You said that gesture wasn't used for didactic functions. Did I, did I misunderstand that? No, I said gesture is used. It was, was it at the start when I was like, when people think about gesture, they think about diaxis and... Did you say that you didn't find it here? People do use diaxis, yeah. Point like diactic gestures. It's just I'm not looking at those in this talk. All right. I, this talk was not looking at diactic gestures. Just in case there were any fans of diaxis in the house, I, I wanted to let them know early. There's lots of really cool stuff to be done um, in terms of diaxis and hills, unsurprisingly, well, in this narrative. Gonna, that's what I was going to ask you, is because I don't know if you get it in Shuba, but in Kiranti, for example, yeah. you have this above the line of sight, below the line of sight, marked in the didactic system. Not lexically, no. No, no this is grammatical in the yeah. Kyoto, uh, in yeah. the Maybe I can ask one sure. question. Uh, so, so you talk about obviously doing ongoing documentation work and you know, encouraging people to use video. So, I mean, how do you do all of this, given that presumably you're also trying to work out how negation in the language works and how mm -hmm. interrogatives work, as yeah. well as then how gesture? Like so step doing. one <laughs> is work on a language that's really closely related to the language you've already written a grammar of. Um, so d do that. Um, yeah, for me, like I, I think for every grant application I've written since my PhD, it's been, I'm gonna look at the grammar and also the gesture and it's taken me seven years to but now that the corpus is built, um, the next postdoc at La Trobe is just finally doing some analysis. Um, and so that's the answer is that I spent four years, five years figuring out grammar stuff and now it's time to finally really get into the gesture stuff. So the other thing is try and get postdocs or students to code stuff for you. It's my other, these are useless tips for most people, but know the language already and have lots of money to pay coders. Um, and then get someone like me to help you do all the literature stuff. It's easy then. Um, yeah, or just at least collect the data and flag to someone that there is cool stuff in there. Because you sit there and you watch it for so long, even though you don't really notice it, you kind of develop a sense of what is common and uncommon. So. Well, if there are no more questions, that's probably a very good point to, to end Thanks. on. So let's thank our speaker again.